Thatcher's ultimate goal was to fundamentally transform Britain itself, to reshape our society in her own image, nothing short of revolution. At that, she succeeded, but change on that scale comes at a heavy price. We're not just talking about fitting a few new windows or replacing some of the wiring, the entire edifice had to be demolished and rebuilt from the basic foundations. The first half of Thatcher's reign was largely about burning down the original socio-economic structures of Britain, the post-war consensus, ready to build a new order in its place. And to achieve that, she had to knock down the last remaining bastion of the old order. The Unions Delenda Est. The coal industry was one of the many pillars of British business nationalised in the 1940s under the administration of the man we will always call Mr Attlee. The subsidies were heavy, as was normal for nationalised mining industries, and the non-departmental governing body was the National Coal Board. By Thatcher's re-election, the head of the Coal Board was Ian McGregor, appointed personally by the PM just before the campaign. McGregor was an eerie Scotsman by birth American by personal preference, with the face and demeanour of Donald Pleasance playing Henry Kissinger, and a reputation even then for dismantling nationalised companies from within. In 1977, he'd been brought back from America by James Callaghan himself to work at state-owned car company British Leyland, ostensibly as deputy to Sir Michael Edwards. He had just enough time to fire famed trade union head Derek Red Robbo Robinson for insubordination, or to take credit for it at least, for the whole company collapsed under the weight of mismanagement, poor strategy, and a nationalised car company just not really being that good of an idea at that moment in time. Undeterred, McGregor moved on to the ailing British steel, which, to his credit, he did successfully return to profitability. However, Rather than achieving this via some kind of carefully designed business strategy that benefited the workers and the industry in general, McGregor did this by simply closing the factories and firing everyone. Which saved money, certainly, but surely wasn't the only way to do so, even if it was the easiest. Results are what matter, however, especially under Thatcherism, and the steel industry was definitely once again profitable. And sure, that's because it was employing fewer people to make less steel, but that right neoliberalism is concerned with the bottom line much more than it is the actual product. British Steel was back in the black and on the road towards inevitable privatisation. With McGregor having built a reputation as a man you put in charge of state-owned companies in order to destroy them, it was a no-brainer for Thatcher to personally pick him out to head the NCB in March of 1983. It was also nakedly provocative. The coal mining industry had been the nemesis of successive governments since time immemorial. The mere existence of this man was a come and have a go if you think you're hard enough to the National Union of Mine Workers. And as it turned out, they did indeed think they were hard enough. The NUM at the time were the most powerful union in the country. They'd been at the heart of most of the industrial disputes of the previous two decades, in particular the three-day week. At one point, practically owned the Labour Party. From 1981, the NUM's leader was a bellicose militant leftist named Arthur Scargill. Despite coming across visually as if Trevor Francis had been cast as Ken Barlow, or alternatively as a slightly less satanic Paul Daniels, he had a certain basic rough and ready charisma, aided by a talent for bellowing far-left rhetoric in the voice of a militant Wallace. Tories have never forgotten the defeat inflicted in 1972 and in 1974. Equally, neither of the miners forgotten the lessons of 1972 and 1974. His main failings were twofold. 
His politics were very slightly to the right of Stalin, and his ego was only marginally smaller. He was the opposing general to McGregor, and greeted his appointment with disdain bordering on outright contempt. The materials were arranged. McGregor the fuel, Scargill the oxygen. All that was needed was a spark. The National Union of Mine Workers is to ballot its membership with a recommendation for industrial action unless the coal board withdraws its plans for pit closures. Earlier this week, the board said it intended to close up to 50 pits over the next two years. This was actually the Thatcher government's second attempt at doing this. The first had been in January 1981, shortly before Scargill took command of the NUM. The government were about to announce the closure of 23 pits, when the Union threatened a mass walkout the minute they opened their mouths. With memory still fresh of the strike from 1973 to 74, which had led to the state of emergency, the three-day week, and the eventual downfall of Ted Heath, Thatcher did something she very rarely ever did, back down. Ghost of Heath notwithstanding, her hand was really forced when someone pointed out that the national stockpile of coal would only last for six weeks, after which they were really at the miners' mercy and in the dead of winter to boot. So Thatcher and her government stayed their hand, allowing the 23 pits to stay open. For now. Shortly after the 1981 strike was averted, Scargill was elected as the head of the NUM and immediately started agitating for an all-out confrontation, which was more than fine by Thatcher, particularly after her landslide re-election. Now she had both time and almost absolute power. <laughs> McGregor's message to the miners, go back to work, I won't give in. But Scargill says, we fight on. On March the 6th, 1984, McGregor inevitably announced the closure of 20 coal mines. Effectively firing 20,000 people in one fell swoop. And not just firing them. Communities grow, or grew, around the mines. They were the centres of the towns. The sole source of employment, in many cases in abruptly murdering 20 coal mines, an entire way of life for thousands of people was wiped out in a single day. It was an old-fashioned way of life, certainly, but again, as with British Steel, progress does have methods other than slash-and-burn social agriculture. Neither McGregor nor Thatcher were interested in them. They made the announcement in the full knowledge that there was a better chance of getting a full blood transfusion from the rockbiter than Arthur Scargill backing down from anything. But they were prepared. After the near miss of 1981, Thatcher ordered her government to start stockpiling coal in secret. By 1984, they had enough to last six months. If Scargill wanted a war so much, and he'd made it abundantly clear that he did, Thatcher was going to be ready for it. The closures had the predicted and predictable effect. Beginning with a wave of walkouts in Yorkshire in the first two weeks of March, Scargill seized his chance and declared that this was now a national strike. Shame about the timing. It was all very well threatening to hold the country to ransom for coal, but the last time this had happened was in January, when people actually wanted and needed the damn stuff. This time, Thatcher and McGregor waited until March, the early spring with the weather already past its coldest point and getting warmer all the time. Neil Kinnock himself, then still relatively new to the job of leading Labour, called Scargill and told him this was completely the wrong point on the parabola, and that he would be much better off waiting a few months, like late August at the absolute earliest, when people would actually start to need what he was denying them. But Scargill, as has been noted, had been spoiling for a fight for years, and he wasn't going to put it off a second longer, no matter what the Labour Party, climate science, or basic common sense had to say about it. Or, for that matter, his fellow miners. The done thing was, of course, to put the strike to a national ballot. Fortunately for Scargill, that wasn't a hard and fast rule or anything. The rules as they stood at the time required a ballot of some sort, 
but not necessarily a full national one. Had it been, Skarga would have been defeated. Despite having an ego as big as the world, he knew perfectly well that his enthusiasm for the strike was not shared by everyone in the national NUM. In Nottinghamshire in particular, their branch of the NUM actively rejected the strike from the start, partly because they were at the time insulated from many of the troubles plaguing the rest of the industry, but mostly because they were put off by Scargill's bullying tactics. In the miserable aftermath of the strike, Nottinghamshire branch actively broke away from the NUM and ultimately formed their own rival union. Not that it really mattered by that point. Scargill's refusal to hold a national ballot Bypassing usual union procedure and etiquette also cost him a lot of potential allies in otherwise friendly unions, and ultimately resulted in the strike being officially declared illegal, although it made little visible difference in the police's actions. Scargill didn't seem to care about any of this. He wanted his war at any cost, including potential allies, national sympathy, and indeed any possibility of victory. And he got it by commissioning the regions to hold their own separate ballots, which was much more likely to give him the result he wanted. And it did. And so the last battle between the working and ruling classes began. It all first came to blows on June the 18th, 1984. The coking plant in Orgreave, South Yorkshire was considered tactically important to Arthur Scargill, the Gibraltar of the strike. Orgreave was a major supplier of coke to British Steel. Not the drink, smart ass, the coal-based fuel used in iron ore smelting. To cut off that supply really would make an economic dent, whether or no whether stockpile or no stockpile. That they would rather that they would much rather not have to suffer because of someone else's war. And so early on in the strike, the NUM made a deal with them and their bosses to keep the coal supply flowing, but limited. Unfortunately, the British steel bosses didn't keep to it. With the Steelworkers Union on side, they were defying the pickets to move a lot more coal than the NUM would had they been a bit more competent have allowed. After a couple of weeks, the NUM figured out what was happening, and Scarco decided to take the relatively dramatic step of picketing the Orgreave coking plant altogether. On the 18th of June, thousands of NUM members and even more thousands of cops with a front rank in full riot gear on horseback descended upon the plant. The cops firing the entrance, the miners staring them down in preparation for the arrival of the coal lorries. By 8 o'clock in the morning, a cop had already been smacked in the face with a brick and carted off to hospital. He was better off out of it. Shortly after, <coughs> Shortly after Brick Cop left the premises, the lorries arrived to pick up the coal. And that was the starting pistol. Miners charged repeatedly at the line of cops, many throwing stones and or fists. Unfortunately for them, the police had several advantages, most notably horses, making the whole thing look a ghastly Orwellian reimagining of the peasants' revolt, which is what it was anyway. But also training, organisation and bloody big cudgels. It was like the battles of antiquity between the Celts and the Romans, with thousands of hairy naked people charging randomly at a few hundred Italians in precisely ordered tortoise formation and getting slaughtered. Only the miners didn't even have the numbers. Inevitably, the miners were defeated. British Steel had their coke, the government and their bosses had their major public victory. And they proceeded to twist the knife with the kind of relish rarely seen outside of a Wes Craven movie. The Murdoch Press reported it like the Belgrano had been sunk again. No one mentioned the fact that, after the crowds had been dispersed, the Mounted Police continued to chase people through the town just on general principles. Although it did get brought up when the occasional stone was thrown at them. An iconic photo was taken of a woman literally seconds from being smacked in the head by a riot cop on a horse, which was duly published in Communist Daily Tabloid The Morning Star, 
and absolutely nowhere else. In fact, one of the major lasting effects of the strike, or more accurately the miners' eventual defeat, was on the media. Specifically, the crushing of the unions gave Murdoch his platform for British newspaper domination. Fairly early on in the strike, mid-May 1984, a few weeks before Royal Grieve, The Sun, then three years into the Kelvin Mackenzie golden age of scum, planned to run a front page with the headline Mine Führer. The accompanying photo, Scargill with his arm raised, would be explicitly described as a Nazi-style salute in the copy. Although since a Nazi salute is in many ways literally just a raised arm, almost everyone in the world who possesses at least one arm, with the possible exception of John McCain, has been in a position where a split-second photo might give the impression of one. Scargill just had his arm up. It looked even less... It looked even less like a Nazi salute than David Bowie's. This was an obvious low blow with little or nothing to do with journalism, as had already become the foul Mackenzie's trademark. Unfortunately for him, but fortunately for anyone who values basic human decency, the printers refused point blank to set it. The issue instead ran with a massive white space and disclaimer. The issue ran instead with a massive white space and disclaimer. It was one of the most significant Union victories of the 1980s, and one of the last. The printers in question were almost all members of the Associated Union, and apart from basic professional integrity, were motivated by the certain knowledge that should the miners lose, they were the next against the wall. And so it proved, with the Mine Führer incident providing a furious Murdoch with the pretext he needed to buy a massive complex at Wapping, move his entire newspaper operation there, and locked the GPMU members out of the building, replacing them with people loyal to the Murdoch Empire and its ideals. By 1989, Kelvin McKenzie's power was so absolute that despite their horror, the staff could do nothing to stop their paper from libelling the victims of the Hillsborough disaster. Meanwhile, five years earlier, the strike dragged on. The NUM's funds stretched increasingly thin. Those of their members tended to snap altogether. No wages, no income, eventually no money at all. Ideology is all very well, but you can't eat it. Miners and their families started starving to death for the sake of Arthur Scargill's ego, which many of them didn't care much for in the first place. And not just starving to death. As autumn dragged into winter, the strike finally started to have an effect on fuel stocks. Unfortunately, it was the miners who were being held to ransom. So now they were freezing to death for Scargill too. Many were reduced to scrambling around the spoil tips in a desperate attempt to scrape together what they could out of the coal equivalent of curds and whey. This was an extraordinarily bad idea because it involved clambering around on piles of slippery shale trying to grab nearby particles of burnable fuel. An even worse idea was asking children to do it, which ended up killing three of them. Death reared its head in an even more gruesome way at the end of November. With miners getting increasingly fed up with the strike, more and more were filing sadly back to work. This had already led to outright civil wars in mining communities, particularly between the mines on the border of Yorkshire and Nottinghamshire, the latter of whom, of course, never went on strike in the first place. On the 30th of November 1984 in Mid Glamorgan, Strike breakers had been ferried around in taxis for quite some considerable time, often under a hail of stones. On this particular day, two morons of considerable magnitude decided to take it a step further and dropped a bloody cinder block off of a footbridge. To the apparent surprise of the douchebags in question, it landed on the taxi driver, David Wilkie, and killed him dead. The Wilkie incident was the beginning of the end. Public opinion made a definitive move away from the unions. Even the traditionally left-wing Daily Mirror and Guardian stopped supporting them as 1984 became 85. 
and when the Guardian in particular turned its back, that was it. The NUM had no chance of getting the public back on side, even without the Murdoch press. Even a likeable figurehead couldn't have helped them now, although in the event they were still lumbered with the increasingly ferret-like and swivel-eyed Scargill. Although genuinely horrified at the death of Wilkie, he still refused to back down from the strike. By the time 1985 rolled around, however, it was largely out of his hands. Miners up and down the country sadly traipsed back down the pits, knowing that the only alternative was for their children to starve to death for the sake of Arthur Scargill. The government, opportunistically, deliberately overstated the number of returning miners, increasing the pressure on Scargill until finally, in the exact sort of national ballot he hadn't held at the start of all of this, the NUM voted narrowly to give up, to return to work without a deal. The National Union of Mine Workers shall organise a return to work on Tuesday. We go back together, and as far as we're concerned, this union fights to retain pits, jobs and communities. The strike had lasted almost exactly a year, and ended for the miners in perhaps the most crushing defeat possible. Thatcher could barely contain her glee. Thatcher could barely contain her glee. This is what she'd been building to since she got the job, in the wake of the winter of discontent. Elected into a country battered by union-related bickering, the one thing she wanted was to destroy the whole notion of trade unionism and reopen the gulf between workers and bosses between workers and bosses, the narrowing of which she saw as the main reason why sainted centre of the world Britain had lost its position as the official best place ever. After the defeats of Scargill and the NUM, unions would never have that kind of power in Britain again to date. The right to organise was dead. The NUM in particular were practically annihilated. They exist now as a tiny organisation of about 750 sufferers of depression, with some branches having as few as four members. Forty years ago, they helped to bring down the government. Ten years later, they were crushed themselves under a colossal fallen ego. They ended up suing Scargill after he refused to step aside after retirement, and also because they figured out they were still paying for his flat. He also founded, and still leads, the far, far, far left Socialist Labour Party, which got a grand total of 1154 votes in the last general election. Frankly, outliving Thatcher is the only success of his entire miserable life. And that's pretty much obliterated by his far greater achievement in the other direction, assisting Thatcher in the removal of the last obstacle between her and implementing her vision of Britain. The vision we still live under now. All hail the new consensus. The